Okay, welcome. We're going to be having a little look at um, the love song of J. Alfred Prufrock. Bit of a mouthful of a name as well. Um, we'll start with the context and then I might put um, it into a separate. Yeah. All right, so what we're going to do is first look at um, some deconstruction tips. So what can you be doing to deconstruct the poem? Um, consider the title. What does it mean? Is there a significance to it? Um, indicate anything important um, that, that may lead us to understand the poem. Um, what you'll find is, spoiler alert, once we start reading about proof rock, um, it's not really a love song as such. It's, it's actually an ironic title. So look out for the irony of the title. Uh, what would you expect? with a title called Love Song because you don't quite get what you expect. Defining and clarifying. So highlight or underline any words or references or phrases that you don't really fully get. And then you can go back and research those and clarify them next to or near their use in the poem. So in your annotation, if there are sections of the poem you still don't understand, um, paint them, at, point them out and return to them later as your annotations become further developed. So I'll give you some annotations and some of it you will need to go and do a bit of research and keep going yourself. Um, summarising and paraphrasing. So read the poem closely and then when you're annotating, um, just get your head around, well, what's actually literally happening before you start looking at the... Um, the techniques and what might be hidden underneath those words. So think about who, what, when, where, why, how and purpose. So what is he trying to convey with his poetry? Um, literary techniques and features. So you should be rereading through the poem, highlighting or underlining uh, any use of figurative language you may see or some literary features. There's a lot of consonants. There's a lot of symbolism in this one. Um, there is a glossary of terms I can provide for you that will help with identifying some of these, but you can Google, you know, literary devices and they all come up, all the usuals. Note the technique will feature clearly next to its usage. So when you're annotating, write down what's happening. You may also evaluate or explain its use and what it conveys within the poem. Why is it being used? What is it, what is it showing us? Why use that technique and not something else? Literary form, so how is the poem organised? So is it lines, verses, is, is there a particular um, uh, relevance to the shape or the layout? Why has the poet decided to structure the ideas in this way? Um, so the sequence of ideas, length of lines, any patterns that you see. Um, Consider the rhyme and, and metre or the rhythm of the poem and identify as part of your annotation. Is there a pattern to it? Is there not a pattern? When you're looking at modernist poetry, quite often it's there, there is some rhythm, there is some rhyme, but it's not consistent. There's no rule. It's actually breaking rules and just doing it, it sometimes in order to highlight maybe a disconnection or to create fragmentation or to create stream of consciousness. Um, and so what is the rhythm and the rhyme doing to the tone, feeling and meaning of the poem? So sometimes the rhyme might be used to show um, raindrops or it may be used to, you know, point out the um, tapping of shoes or something. So um, in some of his poems, that's what he uses it for. And then you interpret themes, ideas and meaning. So there's a bit of subjectivity here. Um, and modernism lends itself to you making your own interpretations about what's going on with the text. Um, so it's about your own personal interpretation of the poem and what it might be communicating. Why is it being done? What are the ideas? What are the ideas you're pulling out? Because that's what happens with modernism they use a lot of symbols in order for you to draw the meaning out yourself and so when we're doing this as a critical study unit 
you've got to really think about what do you think about it your teacher will tell you what she she or he thinks about it I'll tell you what I think about it um, and then you need to go and look up what other people are saying about it is there a consistency are there other ideas that are at play um, so consider what the poet might be trying to convey to the reader slash specifically you what are you getting out of it can you put the ideas together in a group um, and is there an overall message and as you start reading more and more of his work you'll start to see that there may be some consistent images and consistent ideas coming out of that um, think of any issues or concerns that the poem might be exploring and formulate a personal response to what you think are the dominant themes or ideas or the meaning of the poem Okay, and if you could support that with going back and looking at the literary form, that will help you out as well. So, so an introduction and, and, and context. You can't talk about um, any of his work without talking about the fact that he is a modernist and therefore that's impacting the ideas he's exploring and the techniques that he's using. And you've got to keep coming back to that. So when you in that what how effect um, idea that I keep referring to in these videos the what are going to be ideas about um, alienation about um, the impact the negative impact negative ideas of the modern world um, because he is he is exploring this modernism um, it's it's a lot of looking at the self um, this fragmentation um, alienation not feeling connected with other people and then that in the techniques comes through in the fragmentation of the um, narrative structure the enjambment you, it creates that as well um, the use of symbolism the use of um, shifting voice all of these things are then part of the techniques that are up creating these ideas and then what's the effect how is that all making you feel it makes you feel quite confused with the fragmentation the stream of consciousness and all of those sorts of things so if you are feeling a little bit confused and lost well that's exactly the feeling that you should have with modernist texts I know that may not help you but it may make you feel a bit better if you are feeling a bit um, bit lost because you need to put that the whole idea is that it is up to you to put meaning onto it and we can assist with that by going and researching what's that symbol mean what does that reference mean what's that what's that idea what could that mean and going and doing a bit of research and that will help you to unpack it as advanced English students it's all about you doing a bit of extra research so there's often a pessimistic and bleak outlook we've got this fragmentation that happens in the ideas and then it also is happening um, in, as a technique as well so that's really really good to talk about and it really brings the two the what and the how and the effect together and, and it's a good one to talk about if you're um, if, if you're trying to sort of link it back to context um, so there were huge economic changes in the late 1800s and early 1900s there was cultural upheaval um, social upheaval um, industrialization things were you know on one hand things were progressing and moving forward but at what cost and I think we still have that in our own modern worlds now so um, every, everyone seems to think that yesteryear was better yesteryear uh, was an easier time a better time and then um, it's kind of funny that you know we go back and we look at his work coming from about 1915 or 1911 published 1915 and he's expressing a lot of ideas that people still have today it, it's really it's really interesting and it makes it universal and that universality is also a marker of a modernist um, context I'm just going to move my little bubble here so uh, it's written 1910 1911 he's 22 years old 
um, published in 1915. So it's published during World War One, um, written more as a response to the Industrial Revolution. Um, publication likely to have been influenced by Ezra Pound, who encouraged Eliot to publish his poems. Um, he studied Dante, which is a 14th century Italian poet who was instrumental in establishing the Italian literary canon, as well as the inspiration for many other Western writers at Harvard. Dante's influence is explicitly and inferentially refer referenced throughout Prufrock. The poem is written in dramatic monologue. We as responders are invited to hear the sole voice of Prufrock. And we, we're kind of almost invited in as the companion too. So initial impressions. What kind of things might you expect to see in a poem titled The Love Song of Pro Alfred Prufrock? So what would be the content, what would be the purpose, what would be the style? You probably expect it to be quite romantic. You expect it to um, be... Uh, maybe addressed to a beloved um, and then but then we've so love song suggests that but then this very convoluted stilted sort of a name makes us think maybe that's not going to be the case so that's a bit of a hint uh, what's your initial impression of a character called J Alfred Prufrock I personally think he's going to be a bit uptight um, a bit showy a bit maybe self-centred, maybe he's upper class or thinks he's upper class and maybe he's not really. How does Eliot's chosen name impact the poem, even based on the title? So how, for instance, might this actually be different to an Ed Sheeran love song? All right, Ed Sheeran's are probably a bit more romantic and a bit more a thing of beauty. Now what we're going to do, if I can get this to play, We'll listen to a reading. Fingers crossed. It opens. Things almost went very wrong. They may yet. Oh, goody. And now it's opened twice. I'd clicked on that earlier. Okay. Fully. It will load. Yes, here we go. Let us go then, you and I, when the evening is spread out against the sky like a patient etherized upon a table. Let us go through certain half deserted streets, the muttering retreats of restless nights in one-night cheap hotels and sawdust restaurants with oyster shells. Streets that follow like a tedious argument of insidious intent to lead you to an overwhelming question. Oh, do not ask, what is it? Let us go and make our visit. In the room, the women come and go, talking of Michelangelo. The yellow fog that rubs its back upon the window pane. The yellow smoke that rubs its muzzle on the window pane. Licked its tongue into the corners of the evening. Lingered upon the pools that stand in drains. Let fall upon its back the soot that falls from chimneys. Ripped by the terrace, made a sudden leap. And seeing that it was a soft October night, curled once about the house and fell asleep. And indeed there will be time for the yellow smoke that slides along the street, rubbing its back upon the window pane. There will be time, there will be time to prepare a face to meet the faces that you meet. There will be time to murder and create, and time for all the works and days of hand that lift and drop a question on your plate. Time for you and time for me, and time yet for a hundred indecisions, and for a hundred visions and revisions. 
before the taking of a toast and tea. In the room, the women come and go, talking of Michelangelo. Then indeed there will be time to wonder, do I dare and do I dare? Time to turn back and descend the stair with a bald spot in the middle of my hair. They will say how his hair is growing thin. My morning coat, my collar mounting firmly to the chin, my necktie rich and modest but asserted by a simple pin. They will say, but how his arms and legs are thin. Do I dare disturb the universe? In a minute there is time for decisions and revisions which a minute will reverse. For I have known them all already, known them all, have known the evenings, mornings, afternoons, I have measured out my life with coffee spoons. I know the voices dying with a dying fall beneath the music from a farther room. So how should I presume? And I have known the eyes already, known them all, the eyes that fix you in a formulated phrase. And when I am formulated, sprawling on a pin, when I am pinned and wriggling on the wall, then how should I begin to spit out all the butt ends of my days and ways? And how should I presume? And I have known the arms already, known them all, arms that are braceleted and white and bare, and in the lamplight down with light brown hair. Is it perfume from a dress that makes me so digress? Arms that lie along a table or wrap about a shawl. And should I then presume? And how should I begin? Shall I say, I have gone at dusk through narrow streets and watched the smoke that rises from the pipes of lonely men in shirt sleeves, leaning out of windows. I should have been a pair of ragged claws scuttling across the floors of silent seas. And the afternoon, the evening, sleeps so peacefully, smooth by long fingers, asleep, tired, or it malingers, stretched on the floor here beside you and me. Should I, after tea and cake and ices, have the strength to force the moment to its crisis? But though I have wept and fasted, wept and prayed, Though I have seen my head grown slightly bald, brought in upon a platter, I am no prophet, and there is no great matter. I have seen the moment of my greatness flicker, and I have seen the eternal footman hold my coat and snicker, and in short, I was afraid. And would it have been worth it after all? After the cups, the marmalade, the tea, among the porcelain, among some talk of you and me, would it have been worthwhile to have bitten off the matter with a smile, to have squeezed the universe into a ball, to roll it towards some overwhelming question, to say, I am Lazarus, come from the dead, come back to tell you all, I shall tell you all. If one settling a pillow by her head, should say, that is not what I meant at all. That is not it at all. And would it have been worth it after all? Would it have been worthwhile after the sunsets and the dooryards and the sprinkled streets, after the novels, after the teacups, after the skirts that trail along the floor, and this and so much more, it is impossible to say just what I mean, but as if a magic lantern threw the nerves in patterns on a screen. Would it have been worthwhile if one, settling a pillow or throwing off a shawl and turning toward the window, should say, that is not it at all. That is not what I meant at all. No, I am not Prince Hamlet nor was meant to be. 
am an attendant lord, one that will do to swell a progress, start a scene or two, advise the prince. No doubt an easy tool, deferential, glad to be of use, politic, cautious, and meticulous, full of high sentence, but a bit obtuse, at times, indeed, almost ridiculous, almost, at times, you I grow old, I grow old, I shall wear the bottoms of my trousers rolled. Shall I part my hair behind? Do I dare to eat a peach? I shall wear white flannel trousers and walk upon the beach. I have heard the mermaids singing each to each. I do not think that they will sing to me. I have seen them riding seaward on the waves, combing the white hair of the waves blown back when the wind blows the water white and black. We have lingered in the chambers of the sea by sea girls wreathed with seaweed red and brown till human voices wake us and we drown. Okay. So that go back so that first reading that was actually really well read and um, reminded me of some things even though I was following with my annotations but it just is easier when you hear someone reading it really really well kind of like Shakespeare so some things to look for um, iconic poem of the 20th century about alienation and dysfunction they're what you're looking out for examples of that Distills Eliot's poetic vision. It's an exemplar of modernist poetic innovation in form, style, and language. And that's using, you know, the enjambment, the rhetorical devices, the listing, the repetition, the symbolism, and the illusion. Prufrock, you're looking for him as an impotent anti-lover, a persona representative of modern individual. Monologue. Um, it's just his voice coming through and he's not he's talking about what other people are doing but um not not a lot and there's no one else really involved um there is that let us go you and i and he does at times address we assume maybe the reader or maybe a companion but other than that it's it's just him and his voice it doesn't shift anti-romantic scene set in opening stanza um and we also have uh, the beginning reference at the start uh, that we'll talk a little bit about. Um, so the setting's quite grey, bleak, sterile um, and numbed, objective, correlative of proof rocks interior. Uh, life drained of colour, joy and energy. What does he do? Goes to a party to find a lover but crippled by his own sense of inadequacy and insecurity and it's kind of left undone um, I have heard kids of today say oh he's like an incel um, maybe maybe that's what he's getting at he's only uh, 22 when he writes this but he foreshadows it being in the mind of a man maybe in his 40s so some other things you're looking for are the dualities so you've got time Quotidian versus eternal, permanence versus decay, energy versus resistance, love versus misogyny. He doesn't seem to know the difference. Uh, romantic versus anti-romantic. Um, that's an important one. Materialism versus spirituality, confidence versus disillusionment, um, ideal versus reality. So you can go through and listen to... A second reading of it that will be helpful at this point okay so some questions to be asking yourself immediately after just reading it is what is the poem about what's the tone what parts of the poem images lines and ideas jump out at you as you listened why so really the repetition is obvious and some of those rhymes become more obvious as he's reading it and reading it really well um, 
Is there anything there that you were unsure about? The, the Hamlet reference may not make a lot of sense if you haven't read Hamlet and you're not familiar with him. Do a bit of research, but I'll also explain a bit about that in a moment. What do you need to find out um, more about? Here are some focus questions for you to look at. So how is his context reflected in the text's ideas? So that's that modernist idea. It might be uh, the fact that although it's written 1910, 1911, it's published 1915, so it's resonating with that contemporary audience. Um, how did the context influence the reception of his work? What were people saying at the time? Go and do a bit of research on that. Uh, is it possible to read the meaning and or value of the text in different ways? Uh, your perspective may be different than mine. Your teacher may have explained it in a different way. How do the perspectives of others impact your personal response to the text? It could be others that you're reading about. It could be others that you're, you know, hearing about. It could be other students that you're talking to. Um, and how does how, how do the construction, content, and language of the text shape our understanding? So you can also be going back and looking at what is the poem about, what is the poet's purpose or motive in writing the poem, what are the central ideas, what's the predominating mood of the poem, does the mood shift, is there a change, what are some of the feelings expressed by the poet, what response or emotions does the poem arouse in you specifically, and how does the poet succeed in conveying his emotions to you. So it doesn't work. Looking at some language questions. Are the word choices appropriate and vivid? What emotions are built up around certain words and what tone is set? What is the effect produced by the use of metaphors, similes, personification, symbolism, striking description, etc.? What's the effect produced by the poet's use of alliteration, assonance, consonance, onomatopoeia and metre? So here are some allusions to look out for and some of these I'll go in depth with for you um, now and others you will need to do a little bit of research. Dante's Inferno, you basically have um, Dante who, um, you know, no one really returns from hell um, and you do have a character who goes down there um, and is told information because people, you know, it's assumed down there that no one ever goes back. So what's the harm in telling them things? And then, of course, um, the character does return back. Um, very negative start to the poem because that's the first. Um, we've got this idea in um, Latin at the beginning. Michelangelo as an artist, uh, there may be a bit more to it, but basically what he's talking about is that assumed intellectualism that people have. Now, it's no um, mistaking that it's, it's women he's talking about as pretending to kind of understand art in order to sound smarter than they actually are. So there's a bit of misogyny behind there too. Not as, uh, I, I don't think this one is as bad as some of the others. Um, but definitely later on the peach reference, um, there's a sexual undertone to that. And there is a sense of, you know, I don't get anywhere with anyone on this in this um, setting. Um, so he, there's some biblical references you're going to need to go and have a look at to fully unpack it. And then Shakespeare's Hamlet, I will talk about that. He kind of says something along the lines of, I'm not going to be the hero, but maybe I'll be the Lord. And that could refer to someone like Polonius, who's a bit of an idiot, but thinks he's smarter than he is. And that links back to that Michelangelo reference as well. Um, and, of course, you've got Hamlet himself who's unable to act and has um, a situation um, where he... Um, is kind of, um, uh, you know, well, he's unable to, to do anything. He, he's kind of thinking too much about things in order to get there. Um, but so he's the Lord Attendant, so that could be a reference to Polonius, who himself is awkward, 
but not aware of himself enough to realise that he is actually being mocked by Hamlet. Um, and it's used to really show that he's got a pre- that um, the persona's got a preoccupation with his self-image, which is ironic because Polonius isn't very self-aware and he doesn't seem to notice when people are, you know, taking the mickey out of him. And so with his re-examining, as modernism suggests, other texts um, and of the human experience and existence. So there's a few other things there to go and have a look at in order. Uh, Lazarus, of course, comes back from the dead. So that links back to the Dante's Inferno reference at the beginning. Um, and then Lazarus comes back from the dead and to, to show the miracle that Christ um, has enacted. So we've got this allusion to Hamlet. He thinks that Hamlet is capable of action and that this is a good example of how an author differs from the character whom he creates. Hamlet's greatest problem is uncertainty leading to inaction, which Eliot knew. So some techniques to look out for, and a lot of these are also um, associated with the modernist um, time and, and, and as modernist techniques. Repetition, symbolism, imagery, wordplay, enjambment, fragmentation, metaphor, simile, personification, motifs, rhetorical question, consonants and alliteration, rhyme, irony, listing and contrast. And they're the things I want you to be looking out for. I'm not going to, in the annotation, talk too much about the rhetorical question. Uh, because they are very obvious. Um, I will show some consonants and alliteration and um, some of these I will just talk about once or twice because it's a very long poem and the video will go on forever if I unpack it all. So we're looking for symbolism. It's not new but used by modernists to allow the reader to make more individual interpretations. His self-consciousness, which is highlighted through the rhetorical question. So be looking out for those and highlight and annotate those as they come through. Free verse, break away from a set rhyme scheme of the romantics, experimental nature of poetry form and structure, stream of consciousness created by the fragmentation and enjambment, rewriting and revising of past texts and ideas, and he also mirrors this in the poem. And irony, um, he doesn't want to say the wrong thing, but others don't seem to care or aren't self-aware that they are seen by him as silly. Um, you know, who's actually the free one? Is it him or is it the people who um, just don't seem to care or don't seem to know better? Okay, had a bit of a break there. Um, and there's an irony. He doesn't want to say the wrong thing. Oh, yeah, I've talked about that. So he, he's worried not, he's worried about being seen as silly, but other people don't. And I sometimes think that people who just don't care are maybe the happier people. Um, you can go and do a bit of research on Dante's Inferno and what actually is happening there. I'll leave you to find that link and follow it. Um, I'm going to leave the video here and I'll pick up um, on the next video looking at um, analysing the actual poem. So I'll see you in the analysis video.